Nathan, uh, you're here, I think, in part because Mark O'Connor discovered these two splendid but very different books. In fact, with something of academic envy, I might ask you, how do you get a university press to publish two books which are so different? One called God in Proof, uh, the, search, the story of a search from the ancients to the internet, and the other, Thank You Anarchy, notes from the Occupy Apocalypse. <laughs> What's the trick? Well, you'll have to talk to the press about that. <laughs> uh, but but uh, the, the difference in a funny way in my own life doesn't feel quite as, as uh, 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 profound as it might appear looking at the covers. Uh, both, uh, in many ways, are about a search for faith. Uh, one is very explicitly about a search for faith in God, uh, uh, God and proof, as I have written as I was processing, undergoing, uh, working through my own path into, into uh, Catholicism and into the Gospel. Uh, uh, and uh, Thank You Anarchy was ostensibly about a kind of secular faith, about, about a, a community of people, mainly young people, uh, 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 striving for a world that uh, uh, fit their ideals better than the world they saw around them. And, uh, and, and what was striking to me was actually how, how many parallels I found in both of those. So can we pursue a bit of that journey? As I understand it, your parents are Jewish father, Protestant mother. Mm -hmm. um, you lived within the Beltway, but somehow through reading and contemplation, you found yourself on another path. Could you say a bit about that? Well, and their guidance as well. Uh, uh, with my father, I, I, I grew up with an appreciation for uh, European Christian culture. I mean, he, he was a, a, a great lover, for instance, of the German sculptor Tilman Riemenschneider, a German sculptor whose, whose uh, best works were altarpieces that you had to see uh, uh, um, where, they were, where they were carved in the altar. So he traveled as a young man around Germany uh, seeing these altars. Uh, and, uh, and, and then also my mother grew up Protestant, but also was uh, a seeker very, very much. And, and as I was growing up, I uh, kind of tagged along as she went to ashrams and, and gurus and, and uh, uh, different Eastern traditions, uh, uh, particularly Hinduism. And, and so I was, I was exposed to contemplation and contemplative spirituality uh, and kind of diverse spirituality early on. And, uh, and I think most of all, especially for my mother, she wanted, she, she, she treasured the search, and she wanted me to need something. Uh, and I'm not sure that they expected where I would end up going, but uh, in, in kind of funny ways, uh, they, they led me there. You described that a lot of Americans of your generation describe themselves as nuns, uh, and that doesn't mean religious sisters. Uh, could you spell it out a bit? Well, th this term came up, I think, among the sociologists trying to classify uh, people who uh, didn't seem to have a religious affiliation, at least in the, in the categories that surveys uh, allow us, uh, and that's N-O-N-E-S, right? So they uh, seemingly have none. And I think we're starting to, to understand much more, uh, even on the level of the sociologists, that that term none is not really adequate, that there's a lot going on there, uh, that people, that the striving is still going on, but the institutional categories are not necessarily serving that striving. Uh, and, and so to me, this is this, uh, this moment, this growing urge, or this growing uh, uh, kind, of, kind of form of classification, this is actually an opportunity as much as it is a challenge for, for uh, uh, for our religious traditions. I was taken by one thing you wrote, monasticism formed when Christianity became religion of empire. The nuns could play the same role, refounding religion. Could you spell that out, particularly for those of us who are older in the audience? Uh, as I understand it, uh, you had a relationship with a particular monk who helped you on your journey, maybe to describe something of that monastic experience but then also how that replicates itself in some of the reflections of those of your contemporaries who describe themselves as nuns. Well, 
again, as, as I was growing up, I was exposed to this um, spirituality that was often really disconnected from institutions. Uh, uh, you know, people who were who are searching around you know, through my mother, um, but who were very suspicious of um, churches and and you know other kind of formal um, uh, uh, entities. And and along the way, uh, my mother actually went to a Christian monastery, and you know, she did a short retreat there and enjoyed it. And she said, "Hey, maybe you'd like to go there sometime." And I said, "Why would I ever do that?" And then and then something that idea didn't go away with that. And, and a few weeks later, I realized, you know what, I actually really do need to go there. And, and this was a, this is a Trappist monastery, uh, the, the Cistercians of the strict, strict, strict observance, right, the, the silent ones, the, the, um, uh, the, the, among the most austere of, of Christian monastic orders. And, um, and there I saw, actually, a lot of the kind of contemplation and spirituality that I had run into in the scattered, less institutional forms uh, that, that I kind of grown up exploring. And I realized that actually these, these institutions have more to offer than we've often given them credit for. Um, pe people who grow up in institutions often get exposed to a very thin layer of them. You know, they don't encounter stuff like what's going on in the monastery. Uh, and then at the same time, people who, get, who grow up, as I did, outside of these institutions are, are told, again, that the institutions are very, very uh, simple uh, uh, and, and very strict and very, very repressive structures that you don't want to deal with, when in fact, these institutions actually carry these ancient and beautiful, powerful traditions uh, uh, that, that um, can help ground the longings uh, that so many of us feel. So I think there's actually there's a, uh, uh, there, there's a return uh, that, that might be happening. There, there, there was an article in the Times this, this past week in the New York Times uh, that was talking about something completely different. It was talking about um, driving, young people driving, that young people in the US are starting to buy cars again, right? And it was saying that, that, uh, that maybe it was a, uh, it's a kind of deferred adulthood going on in the midst of a, of a um, tumultuous time and, and I wonder whether we might be seeing a kind of deferred return to these religious institutions, a, re a reclamation of the riches in them. I, I think the institutions need that, and I also think my generation needs that, and the generation's younger. I think we need to, to be more of, again, to, um, uh, to these traditions, to these institutions that can help ground our striving. I noticed that one of the blogs you founded and contributed to is called Killing the Buddha. And uh, maybe just to uh, quote a little of the Chinese Buddhist sage Lin Chi, is it? Uh, after years on his cushion, a monk has what he believes is a breakthrough, a glimpse of nirvana, the Buddha mind, the big payoff. Reporting the experience to his master, however, He's informed that what has happened is part of the course, nothing special, maybe even damaging to his pursuit. And then the master gives the student dismaying advice. If you meet the Buddha, he says, kill him. Why kill the Buddha? Because the Buddha you meet is not the true Buddha, but an expression of your longing. If this Buddha is not killed, he will only stand in your way. Explain. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, it, I hope to make clear, first of all, that the saying is nothing against Buddhists, it is from Buddhism. Uh, and, uh, but it also is from, I think, so many of our traditions, and it, it resonates deeply with the message of the Gospel, and I think the practice of Jesus Christ is, as well. Now, that, that community, uh, Killing the Buddha, is a, is a, is a literary magazine of, about religion. Uh, uh, started by a couple of journalists I deeply admire, Jeff Charlotte and Peter Manso, and uh, I got involved to learn from them. Uh, it was kind of a, um, a you know journeyman phase or something in the medieval guild lexicon, and 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 I was, uh, uh, and and that community was one that was full of people who represent the kind of complexity of the American 
religious experience. A lot of us are half Jews, and uh, uh, or half something, right? Um, and uh, uh, nobody who's quite any one place. And, uh, and yet at the same time, there was a uh, there was an urge to find ways to tell stories that really captured our experience. Again, recognizing that those institutional boxes don't fit for good reason. Uh, because we were born into a situation where the, they just don't work. You know, I'm half Jewish, but it's my father's half. And, well, I also became Catholic, and, well, it doesn't... What, what box do I check? I don't know. Uh, so many of us feel that. You know, we're not rejecting institution because we just don't like institution entirely, um, but because the institutions just don't fit our experience. And uh, what we try to do in, in, with Killing the Buddha is use narrative as a means of capturing what the categories themselves can't capture. Uh, and use stories, and we found that stories are really the best way to begin and to recognize that there is something real going on. There isn't just numbness happening there. There's, there are paths that people are on. Uh, and you know, I was I was the, uh, one of the few in that group who was a you know car carrying member of a, of a religious community. But even so, there's a lot of nunness about me, you know, and in my background. And the, the category Catholic doesn't capture it at all. Uh, uh, and that's you know also why it felt uh, necessary to uh, to write it in the story. This helps to give us some of the context for your own involvement in the Occupy movement. And in terms of the rubric of tonight, can enemies become friends working for peace in a violent world? I think particularly those of us on the other side of the world, those of us in an older generation, uh, we don't really know much about what Occupy Wall Street was about. Could you maybe give us a bit of a travel narrative of it first? I mean, Tell us how it plugged into your spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it really for me started with that question of story. Uh, uh, I, I was I got mixed up with a group of people who I, I'd actually met in um, in the, the uh, living room of Daniel Berrigan, the, the um, Jesuit priest, and uh, there were a group of other young journalists who were interested in social change. We're interested in, um, you know, this was coming out of a period of, of uh, not quite coming out, but uh, emerging through a period of ongoing war in the U.S., uh, the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, and, uh, and we're, we're looking for ways of, looking for alternatives. And um, we all got very interested in this challenge of nonviolent struggle. How can people address their their conflicts, work through their conflicts without resorting to F-16s and cluster bombs. Uh, and, um, and it seemed to us that story was really important there. Uh, that there was, a, there was a lack of story that enabled people to so quickly turn to violence as their only, as their only option. And so we set about wondering, what would it look like if someone covered movements for nonviolence, uh, or, or not movements that use nonviolence to bring about change, with the same kind of um, attention and fascination and, and um, uh, concern and expertise that people use to cover wars and, and politicians, right? And so we started a, a website called Waging Nonviolence, and we set about the task of just trying to keep track of all the the nonviolent movements for change happening around the world. What techniques were they using? What strategies? How were they talking to each other? Uh, how are they operating? What was coming up that nobody was noticing? Uh, and and it, we started this in 2009. It um, uh, kind of slowly grew for a couple of years, and then 2011 happened. Like what happened at the beginning of 2011? You know, the world seemed to be turning upside down. Suddenly, this thing that we thought we were the only people in the world interested in, along with a few others, was what everybody was paying attention to. The capacity for ordinary people to bring about change through nonviolent organizing. You know, Tunisia had 
been turned upside down, Egypt had been turned upside down, this, this sense of possibility was spreading around the world, and, um, and we were trying to follow it. Um, one thing that we noticed was, uh, was there, there wasn't, um, the, the reporters would only show up when these actions actually started. There seemed to be a missing link. Um, it, it, it tended to, to, to result in a story in which um, these movements seemed to occur spontaneously. And we knew that wasn't true because we knew some of the people who'd been involved in planning for a long time. So I started looking out for planning. I started looking out for that human agency, uh, uh, the, the ways of telling stories in which, in which these movements for change just don't come out of nowhere because things get really bad. They come out of us because we have the imagine, imagination and the courage to make them possible. And, uh, and, and I started looking around me in the US. Is anybody in the US uh, trying to join this movement of 2011, this global movement? Uh, for change, for democracy, and um, and that was what led me uh, to the to the planning meetings that led to Occupy Wall Street. So, what what do you think uh, sparked when that message was sent out? Occupy Wall Street, bring tent, mm -hmm. September 17, 2011. What what sparked in you? Well, I think one thing that I learned in that moment, and, and this is something I, I carry with me a lot uh, today, and that guides a lot of my work is that often we think that movements for change happen because things hit rock bottom, right? Things get so bad that people have no choice. Actually, I don't think that's true. And I don't think that, I think 2011 is a very, very powerful um, uh, antidote to that way of thinking. Because, you know, for instance, in the US, this wasn't the bottom of the, of the recession. This wasn't the worst time after the economic crisis, this was actually right about when things started getting a little better. Right? What was important about that moment, and what I think sparked it, was that sense of possibility of seeing those movements around the world. Um, uh, seeing that something was possible when people banded together enabled people to start imagining doing something for themselves. And, and, and I think that's <coughs> Um, as I look back in the history of social movements, and I look at what's happening around us now today, um, uh, th that continues to, to bear out. That we're, we're driven more by hope than by desperation. And that, and that the, the possibility of making change and of standing up and of, of offering an alternative comes about, most of all, when we feel that we can do something, not that we're uh, absolutely trapped and had no other choice. Am I right in thinking there was initially a certain naivety that I think at one stage it's described as we are the 99% and we're taking on the 1% there in Wall Street or those who exercise power, particularly through US politics, the economy, etc. But gradually within the 99% uh, all is not well, is it? Or there's there's not the same sense of coherence and divisions start to develop. And so what's being proclaimed is a message of nonviolence, but what's going on within the 99% then starts to fracture. Can you take us on something of that journey? Well, I, I, there was a process through that movement, through this, this, this period where you know, first a few hundred and then thousands and thousands of people were uh, occupying space near Wall Street in New York City and then around the world as well. Um, uh, there was a process in that period where people started realizing that the problem was much more complicated than they had realized. And, and you know, I say this as a, as a white American, for instance, who um, uh, many of people in, in, who share that category with me went in seeing the problem in a certain way. This recession happened, something um, was taken away from us, and we're upset about it, right? But as they started occupying space, meeting with new people that they might not otherwise encounter, they started realizing, oh, some people in this country never had what we had. And actually, we can't talk about and work around economic inequality in this country, in the United States, without talking about racial inequality and gender inequality, all sorts of other things. But in, 
I think racial inequality was the, was the largest one. You know, very early in that in that occupation, um, a black man was executed in Georgia, Troy Davis, and there was a big march, a march mainly of people of color coming to to occupy Wall Street, and a lot of these these young people said, "Oh no, no, we're here to protest Wall Street, not you know, we're we're sorry about that guy who was probably." Uh, probably an innocent man who was executed. Um, uh, but that's not our issue. And, and one of the things that ended up playing out through that movement, and in some ways leading to its end, was the realization that the frame wasn't encompassing enough. It wasn't big enough. And, and many of those people now have gone into the movement for black, black lives now, um, uh, recognizing that that uh, how much racial justice in our history is intertwined with the struggle for economic justice. I remember you wrote in one of your blogs, uh, Occupy was confounding the normal political spectrum. It wasn't just people aligned with what are normally called the left or the right, but an assemblage of people who reflected the inadequacy of right and left spectrum for reflecting people's longings, libertarians and anarchists, socialists and liberals, veterans and peaceniks, conservatives and utopians. Over time, a more familiar leftist activist culture came to dominate the movement. At right about that time, with the help of coordinated repression, it started losing steam. Mm -hmm. Could you say more about that? Well, so much of what you read there could also be actually applied to the church. Uh, I, and that was something that that struck me in this movement, that as people came together and went about trying to build change, starting with how they related with each other, the inadequacy of the usual political boundaries just became so clear. You know, nobody really fit into any of those boxes. And, and politics, after all, does, must, should begin with what we need, what we want, what we build uh, in our communities with each other. Um, and this is something that I think that, that has been a great gift to me uh, in, in the Catholic Church. He said it's, it's a space, um, I hope it can be even more of a space, where people of many different labels come together and look, look at each other without seeing those labels, uh, and learn from each other without seeing those labels. And the moment when we turn the church into an ideological category, when we turn it into a political party, or when we align it so much with a certain political party uh, that uh, it starts to become synonymous, it stops being a church. And, and I think a movement also stops being a movement. One way I think one can actually define a movement is, the mo is, is a moment when the political categories fail or get, uh, uh, get uh, challenged and, and get redrawn. And I, I, I hope the church is a place where that is happening all the time. In Thank You Anarchy, you uh, described the preparations to occupy the Episcopalian Church in downtown Wall Street, and that's obviously something of a turning point for you. Can you say something about that? Well, after the, after the police uh, uh, cleared the square quite violently, uh, uh, and, and a lot of people were arrested, and a lot of people at that point had given up their homes, their lives, they moved across the country to participate in this, and so there were a lot of people left homeless by this. Some of them had been homeless before. And, um, and so there was a kind of grasping for what do we do next, where do we go next? And, and this Trinity Wall Street is more than a church, it's a large real estate corporation uh, thanks to a colonial land grant. And so it owns a great deal of land uh, across the across the city, and so the, the the activists started pressing on this church to um, to to offer some of its land to the movement, which may or may not not have been a good idea. But one thing that struck me was all these activists who had kind of been I thought of as mainly secular people. They weren't confronting the church because it was a church. You know, they weren't saying, you know. Churches are bad, therefore give us your land. They're saying, they were saying church, act like a church. They had these ideas of what a church is supposed to be, like a place that offers sanctuary. Um, they, they would set up, there, there was one moment where they got one of those little 
mini tents that you guys see in the uh, uh, camping stores, right, that are like facsimiles of the tents that they're selling. They somehow got one of those, <laughs> I don't know how, and um, placed it in front of the church with, um, with, with you know, a, a, a nativity scene, except made up of activists. And, uh, and, then, and it had the, uh, the biblical passage, there was no room left in the inn. You know, they were using the biblical language, I think, quite correctly, uh, uh, in, this, in this encounter with the, with the Episcopal Church. And that, to me, um, raised the question of, of what the Catholic Church would do. The Catholic Church is the largest landowner in New York City. Um, I could see a conflict brewing. Can you just repeat that? The Catholic <laughs> Church is the largest landowner in New York City. Really? Yes. <laughs> Um, full of, of um, un unused or underutilized buildings, by the way, that um, would be excellent candidates for um, uh, sanctuary. Uh, but but um, I could see a conflict brewing and, and uh, started realizing there wasn't really a Catholic presence in this movement. So I banded together with uh, um, uh, 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 some few people with colors, uh, uh, Older priest who'd been a longtime activist, uh, Father Paul Mayer, who passed away since, um, someone who I learned a great deal from, a uh, uh, sister of St. Joseph, uh, uh, Sister Susan Wilcox, uh, and, and a, a group of others who, 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 like I had while covering this movement as a journalist, had actually all along been seeing this as informing their faith. Um, and, and so soon I started making this transition, this and or transition, never complete, uh, from being just a reporter to, to really standing up within the movement and, and articulating a Catholic understanding of it. And, and in a funny way, you know, it was odd. And this is where I think um, these books start to fit together. You know, even at the end of God and Proof, I'm not really sure whether I believe any of these proofs, right? And I'm not sure what I really stand behind. Uh, it, it wasn't until in my involvement as a Catholic with these, with this ostensibly secular justice movement that I, I really kind of felt like I came into my own and understood, understood where the gospel, something about what the gospel meant in my life, and, the re and, and, and was able to stop the kind of constant questioning um, and, and enter that faith more fully than I had before. Um, it's a funny way that that worked. You would think the God book would be the place where the faith really was, but it took something else. It took, it took that experience of, of, um, of justice, of mercy, of, of um, a conflict, actually, you know, a provocation of, of messiness um, to, for, for that gospel of love to really become more real. You, you write with, with respect to them, I say, almost boyish enthusiasm when Daniel Berrigan turns up at the protest. Could you say a bit about that and your reaction and his role? Well, he, he was somebody who'd been, a, who, who I'd been by that point seeing just about every month for a few years. Uh, you know, How'd you get in his door? Uh, well, the, the monk at the monastery in Virginia uh, used to be used to have a much more uh, colorful life in New York before he became a monk. He knew some of the people involved in that circle, uh, also people with some very colorful lives. And and when I moved to New York, he uh, uh, passed me some highlights of his Rolodex, and uh, and that led me to to Dan Bergen's living room. And, um, and into the community that he lived with of, of, um, uh, of Jesuits and, and friends. And so uh, they had become kind of mentors to me. Uh, he, was, he was getting very, uh, he was approaching 90 by that time, uh, getting very elderly, you know, kind of a different man in certain respects uh, than, than you would uh, you know, see in the FBI Most Wanted list. Uh, in the 60s, but he, he was still, um, the, the sharpness of his tongue was undiminished, and, and the beauty of, of how he would say a mass, um, uh, just bringing back the, the vitality of those beautiful words by turning them around and 
in, in the ways that he always would as a poet. Um, so, so seeing him at, at, at Occupy meant a great deal to me because it was that continuity. You know, we, we do have that tendency in, 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 uh, uh, in this generation to imagine everything is new and everything is happening for the first time. But I, I knew it wasn't because, you know, I knew him and, and others who, who'd uh, been involved in things past. And, and to see him come, I thought like, okay, we're, we're not on our own. You know, we're part of a, we're part of a history and a legacy. Um, and and the, the funny thing was, is he, he arrived at a, just before a big march was about to start, and and, um, uh, and there were reporters everywhere, and this and this Greek uh, uh, TV man, cameraman came up and said, you know, I really I want to interview that that old guy over there because I want to show the world that this isn't just a bunch of young radicals, right? And I just uh, you don't know who you're. To, this, this is the most radical guy. I mean, this guy spent more time in prison than everyone else here combined. Um, uh, but it, it also a reminder of how our of how books can deceive. Berrigan came to Australia once, and he gave uh, only one public lecture here in the Dallas Books Hall, and I was invited to give the vote of thanks. And um, it was at the height of the anti-nuclear movement, and one stage a woman got up to ask a question. She said, "It's just all so depressing. What can you possibly do?" And uh, Dan got up wearing his check shirt and chewing on a toothpick. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, sometimes I feel like that. And you know what I do? I just put on my walking shoes and I go out and break the law. <laughs> <laughs> so I said at the end of it, it was a tribute to the sense of irony of the organizers that they invited me, the only practicing Jesuit lawyer in the country, to propose a vote of thanks to the most civilly disobedient Jesuit in the Western world. <laughs> Uh, but it was your reflections on Berrigan that got me thinking, I mean, particularly under this theme of working for peace in a violent world. I mean, Berrigan himself had to go an extraordinary conversion experience, particularly when he went and visited his brother Jesuits in Latin America, who were involved in violent struggles. And that for him was an extraordinary tension. And there'd been the years of anti-nuclear protest and I just, as I was reading Thank You Anarchy, I was thinking, well, like, I was a university student during the 1970s here in Australia, and they were, you know, there were lots of protests, etc. A lot of us came through the protest era, but then we went and got on with our lives or did different things. But then there were the Berrigans of this world who, I mean, they stayed in there on the life of protest, year in and year out, going to prison, etc. Um, where's the long-term dividend of Occupy and what you've been part of? Well, it's a good question. And, and I think it's important to recognize something about them that, that was, um, that not everybody saw. You know, among the people who surrounded him at the end of his life, it wasn't all or even mostly protesters. You know, it was actually a lot of people who suffered. And who who um, who he had come to know not through his acts of resistance, but through his acts of compassion. Uh, you know, in particular, a, a dear friend of of uh, mine and my wife's, uh, Maureen, who who met Dan because uh, uh, her husband was dying of AIDS, and Dan was there for him. Uh, and and so in his last years, she would she would take him to movies and. Um, uh, bring in martinis, <laughs> and and uh, so, so I think there was a lot more to that life than than protest, and and he knew that he needed more, and he was always a poet. He was always living for beauty, and um, and he he uh, I think was only able to sustain the protest because there was much more to him. And for the movement itself, um, I think it's important to recognize that movements go through different phases. Um, uh, one kind of typology I, I rely on a lot is it was developed by a, um, an activist named Bill Moyer in the 70s and 80s, and um, he'd been training a bunch of different activist groups and realized that actually the moments when they felt like things were really falling apart were the most important. Uh, because 
What movements have to do to survive this evolve? They have to change, they take different forms. They often take, they go through a phase of a kind of um, uh, uh, useful exuberance, right? Um, and then they evolve into something that's more institutional and that's able to, to confront power more directly. Uh, and, and you see this for any successful movement. There are moments when it's ugly and messy and the conflict is just so raw. And then it evolves into something that's able to lobby a government uh, and, uh, and wield uh, power uh, uh, where it needs to be wielded in order to, to make change. And that also involves compromise. It's interesting to see how this movement is evolving. For instance, uh, in the US, uh, the, the rise of, of uh, Bernie Sanders as a presidential candidate, I think, surprised Sanders more than anybody else. Um, that he, he was kind of taken up by this group of young people who were looking for somebody who would, who would speak out against uh, uh, the, the kind of the things that we accept as normal in the United States, like not having health care and, and having a, a government uh, controlled by corporate interests and these sorts of things. And they just, they took him up and they turned him into a serious candidate. And that was an amazing transformation. You know, there's a lot of tension with what was going on in Occupy Wall Street, a movement that was very, very cautious not to focus on candidates because it wanted to focus on the politics of, of everyday life, a different kind of politics. Um, so there's it's not a transition without tension, and it's not, and there are many other directions that people went in that are also good. Uh, but, uh, but it is interesting to see this, this energy evolve and take different forms. And you see that also in the, in the history of movements within the church, you know, where there's St. There's Francis and then there's the Franciscans, and there's a tension between those. Um, and I think any movement for change uh, has to endure that tension and, and navigate it. Well, then, surely a difficult question for you and young Americans like yourself is, I mean, it's almost like, should you be killing this Buddha of local young initiatives given just the dreadful situation of your mainstream politics at the moment? I mean, what we've heard in recent days from Trump and Clinton, I mean, it's, it's very violent political language, isn't it? Uh, is there a need for your generation of idealists to be killing off something of the Buddha of just uh, your ways of networking and recommitting to the mainstream political agenda? Well, absolutely. And I, and I, I think uh, certainly people are doing that. And, and the, the Sanders campaign, which is a you know, was a very serious and continues to be a very serious threat to the kind of Clinton establishment is an example of that, of, of a way in which uh, people were able to enter that political process kind of on their own terms. You know, some of those people were actually involved in a, in a campaign before that, before Sanders announced his candidacy, to draft Elizabeth Warren, who's a senator, you know, also a, a very kind of, uh, uh, a senator who has a history of, of being um, uh, very strident uh, toward Wall Street and and, um, uh, and and kind of combative toward the financial interests. And uh, what was interesting is how they built a campaign without a candidate. You know, they were they were kind of experimenting with what can, this kind of campaign would look like, um, and 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 playing through that tension a little bit, building something of their own, but but kind of hacking the political system. And and the Sanders campaign was a. Uh, a further expression of that, and it will continue. I think the real question now for that effort is how that that energy can can start uh, working at, at other levels. You know, can start if if Sanders doesn't reach the nomination, how how that uh, momentum can spread throughout the system. But I do think there's something actually really correct that I would not like to see killed about that that original Occupy impulse, which is. To say that actually we need a politics where politicians matter less, you know, maybe maybe you're lucky enough to have that here. I don't know, but one in which one in which whatever Joker wants to get up and be king, right, doesn't matter that much. 
you know, that people are still getting what they need and they're still able to figure out what a good life looks like. And questions can be adjudicated regardless of, you know, whether some blowhard, uh, uh, you know, wants the, wants the big seat. Um, I think that's the direction that de democracy calls us to, is one in which, you know, we are our own leaders. And our leadership is shifting and dynamic and comes from the bottom. Um, and you know, I think that's, this is a question for us to pose to ourselves as a church, too. You know, not to say that the whole structure is, is, is wrong, but to say that you know, how can we recognize the voices of the least among us? Uh, and you know, St. Clair, in, her, in, her, in the rule that she wrote for her, for her sisters, uh, uh, she, she made sure to insert something that the, that the bishops and popes didn't have in the draft that they made for her, which was that, that, um, that the sisters should hold chapter meetings, and that every sister's voice should be heard. You know, because sometimes God speaks through the least among us. And, and I think that even in the midst of this crisis that we're experiencing in the U.S. presidential campaign, actually, my response to it is we've got to build up from the bottom. You know, sure, maybe we have to fight a battle to prevent something really bad from happening at the top. But the more important, the long-term struggle, I think, is to build... Um, to build power and to build leaders um, uh, from among us. And one last question for me before we turn over to the audience. Um, working for peace in a violent world, from your experience with the Occupy movement and your reflections in God and fruit, is justice enough? Or does Pope Francis's emphasis on mercy really need to come in here? I think we always need mercy, and, and mercy begins with, with a, a recognition of our own need for it. You know, that, to me, the, the, um, it, it, kind of the saddest thing about, about the, the, I'll say it, the, the Trump phenomenon is, is the rallying around a leader who is unable to express his own, his own weakness, um, especially in relationship to God, but in general. Uh, that, that is so disconcerting because it is that recognition of our own weakness and our own fault that allows mercy to come in. Mercy is that, is that forgiveness and that, and that very material healing that comes when we ask for something. You know, when, we're, we're, when we're able to have that humility to, to, um, uh, to, to offer ourselves to each other as we are uh, and, and uh, uh, and, and to no longer wear the, the mask of kind of self-confidence and self-righteousness that, that sometimes seems necessary uh, in public life. And, you know, that was something that, too, I've seen in, in Occupy and in movements around the world is, is, is they, they, they kind of rest in their, in their most vital moments on a recognition of, of their kind of humanness and their frailty and, and and their ordinariness, you know, they, they embrace the messiness of the, the um, of their condition, and they start from there, rather than starting from uh, a position of privilege and of of, um, of, of, of of power. So, this is a call. This call to mercy, um, jubilee, is, you know, it's only half of the story, right? The, the, the jubilee in, in, ancient, in ancient Hebrew tradition kind of rests on this understanding that the way the world works isn't really just. And it never really will be. And so every once in a while you do need to kind of clear the debts. You know, the, the monetary debts, you know, the economic debts as well as the spiritual debts. Um, and so it, it's, you know, maybe the degree to which this idea of a, of a jubilee of mercy is kind of bouncing off the culture and, and not always resonating is, is in that inability that we might have to, to recognize the injustice around us. Uh, but, but I think when we recognize it, when we see it in ourselves and, our, and in our world, the, the need for mercy, the, 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 the wisdom of a jubilee becomes obvious.